All right, so in computer science, a function is a little snippet of code that takes an input, does some stuff, and returns an output. A function is called pure if it has no side effects and it returns the same output when given the same input. Functional programming is a style in computer science that's built around pure functions, alongside the techniques that are necessary to actually do that in practice. In particular, it's a style that discourages the use of mutability and global scope. All right, so the main question that we're gonna ask today is why would you do this to yourself? Pure functions are like normal functions, except with extra restrictions on them. So when you're doing functional programming, it's like doing normal programming, but you're allowed to do less stuff. In the rest of this video, we're gonna try to figure out what's going on here and why so many people decide to do this to themselves. As a starting point, let's take an example from every intro to computer science class building a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It's something designed to get you to think like a computer. And no matter what you do, they always tell you to give more detailed instructions, as if a real developer wouldn't have access to libraries. Barring pedantic professors, this works well the first time you go to create a sandwich. But if you want to make another one, you run into all sorts of problems. Your kitchen is a mess. The drawer is open. The knife is out. The jar of peanut butter is open and out on the counter. And the jelly is already out of the fridge. If you send your robot back and tell it to follow the same instructions, it'll go something like this. The problem here is twofold. The program depends on the state of the kitchen in order to work correctly, and it modifies the state of the kitchen every time it runs. If we had access to a magic function that didn't affect anything else but always created peanut butter, and we also had similar functions for bread and jelly, then we could combine them together to make a sandwich. What's more, because these are isolated, we can run them again and again without worrying about the state of the kitchen. On smaller projects, many developers found it easy to deal with mutation. But as their projects grew, the mutable state became harder and harder to manage. They had a bunch of different little snippets of code, all trying to make changes in the same areas, and eventually they started to run into conflicts. Deep down, these are all issues around complexity. People were running into so many issues dealing with mutability and global scope that they decided it would be easier to just get rid of it entirely. There are many issues related to this, but today I want to focus in on some of the biggest factors. Consider the following snippet of code that compares two lists. This takes two lists, looks for the first element where they differ, and then runs the comparison on that element. This is the same as the default string comparison if you treat strings as lists of characters. This method is mutable because it loops through the list by removing elements from it. This is confusing because most developers use this function to get the result of the comparison, but mutability makes it have an additional unrelated effect. If you go to use this comparator, the comparison will work correctly and give you the right result. But then later in the program, when you try to access the value of team one, you'll get the wrong answer. This is because the compare method modified the list even though the developer didn't expect it to. This gets even worse when compare is used somewhere deep in your call stack. If you try to use this method as the comparator for a sorting algorithm, the entire sort will just return garbage. What's worse, it'll be flaky and unreliable. If lists generally have different first elements, this will work most of the time. But as soon as you put in a different input, it'll return something completely nonsensical. Sort of related to this is unit testing. If I have a function that's pure, then I only need to test the mapping of inputs to outputs. To fully test the behavior, I can just create the inputs, call the function, and then verify that the output was what I expected it to be. Of course, to fully verify this, I have to test it out on different types of inputs. But the structure of the test is the same and fully encapsulates the behavior of the function. If the program relies on mutability, there's all sorts of other edge cases that I have to test for. What happens if I call the function again, but the global state is different? And more confusingly, what happens after I call the function? If I rely on impure functions, I have to test all of these scenarios in order to get complete coverage. Deep down, what's going on in both of these examples is that impure functions increase the surface area of your API. The API of a pure function is defined entirely through its input and output, but an impure function can interact with the world in all sorts of other ways. This brings us to our next problem. Concurrency is hard. Consider the seemingly innocuous function that increases the player's score. It looks totally fine, but if you try to run this in parallel, disaster happens. We'd expect the program to execute like this, but because the threads can run in any order, the program might actually execute like this. If the threads aren't executed in the right order, the whole program breaks and you get the wrong value. We have ways to deal with this, like locks and queues, but even those take a lot of thought and careful planning. The order matters here because both threads are trying to read and modify the same bits of data. Because pure functions can't access or modify anything outside of the scope of the function, they also can't access or modify things that are touched by other threads. When we use pure functions, everything is isolated, so we just avoid this problem entirely. 
Consider the following program, which computes the Fibonacci numbers from 0 to 100 and adds them to a list. If we wanted to run this in parallel, we'd have to be exceedingly careful, because we might run into concurrency issues when the list is modified. In contrast, if we did this in a functional style, and get Fibonacci was a pure function, we could confidently transform the map into a parallel operation without any additional planning. Okay, so having pure functions is great, but like, how do you actually do it? Let's start with a simple example of building a response to a web request. In the mutable style, we can start with a mostly empty HTML string, and then use different functions and methods to add stuff to it. This starts with a template that's fundamentally incomplete, and then add stuff to it during the life of a program, sort of like building a house brick by brick. In contrast, in the functional style, you would think of the HTML response as a template, with certain parts of that template left to be evaluated elsewhere. You'd then fill in the missing pieces, which in turn might call out to other methods to build up the rest of the subcomponents. What's interesting here is that the functional style is fully defined at the time that it's first declared. In the imperative style, it actually represents something different at different points in time during the program's evaluation. Pure functions are interesting because they behave less like a procedure and more like a function in mathematics. Because a pure function always returns the same output for the same input, it's fully defined by the mapping of inputs to outputs. It also doesn't have any side effects, so you don't need to worry about how the function is actually executed. Any pure function with the same mapping of inputs to outputs is behaviorally exactly the same, even though some implementations might be more efficient. What's really interesting is that because the function is fully defined by this mapping of inputs to outputs, we can think of it more like a data structure, like a dictionary or a hash map, rather than an action that does something. In the mathematical view, a function is just a set of points in space. I find it helpful to think in this way when designing functional programs. Instead of thinking of them as a set of instructions or actions passed to a machine, it can be helpful to think of them as complete objects built of smaller subcomponents, where some parts of the object are yet to be evaluated. HTML templating is a pretty common design pattern, so let's look at a more interesting example. What's tricky here is that this function does something many times, so traditionally you would need a loop to encapsulate this behavior. The loop uses an index that increases from 0 to 99 during each iteration of the loop. In the functional world, one way to handle this is through recursion. We can sort of loop through all the numbers from 0 to 99 by recurring on the function with smaller and smaller numbers. This is technically the ideological equivalent of using i minus minus, but I think this style is easier to follow for recursive methods. Importantly, the return statement is a complete description of the final output, with some steps left to be evaluated. In particular, get squares of 99 is actually equal to 99 squared plus get squares of 98. This pattern is so common that some languages even offer an optimization called tail recursion, which makes the recursive implementation as efficient as the imperative one by transforming the recursive calls into while loops under the hood. You have to be careful though, because some languages don't. Some languages don't offer tail recursion intentionally because there's one guy that doesn't like this recursive style. There's also another way to think about this. In this example, we're using the index i to iterate through or do something to all of the numbers between 0 and 99. What's interesting is, in the functional world, instead of iterating over a single integer variable, we can instead think about i as the entire list of numbers from 0 to 99. Then, instead of iterating over an integer, we can view this as a static operation on that list of numbers. And in order to compute our answer, we can take the list, map each element to its square, and then add everything up, reducing the list down to compute the answer. This pattern of taking a list and making a new list by doing something to each of the elements is so common that we can abstract out the bits of common code. If we wanted a generic function that does something to every element of the list, we could write it like this, and then pass the operation, squaring each number as input. In the functional world, map is this function that takes a list as input and creates a new list by applying a function to every element of that list. This style of using code that takes a function as input is very common in functional programming. A big part of the reason is that without objects, we need tools to specify what happens to each element in an arbitrary size data structure. Alongside map, we have reduce, a tool for combining elements down and collecting them, often to a smaller final result. This pattern of using map followed by reduce is so popular that there are even infrastructure frameworks named after it. 
It's powerful because we can use functional programming's ability to play nice with concurrency to run MapReduce jobs at enormous scale. Now at this point, you might be asking yourself, if I have to create a new list every time I use map, isn't that super inefficient? If I really want my functions to be pure, don't I have to use immutable data structures everywhere in my code? What if I only want to change one element of an array? Won't I have to copy the whole thing? We'll be answering these questions and more in part two of my video on functional programming. I hate to split these into parts, but there really was so much content that I couldn't cover it all in a single video. Make sure to like and subscribe to the channel to keep an eye out for it when it drops. And feel free to leave comments on this video letting me know what you think. I do read each and every one of your comments, and I put a lot more effort into getting consistent audio quality in this video, so I hope that's something that you all enjoyed as well. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.